move, let's move up from the fold. Uh, there's an interesting element to his breastplate here, isn't there? Because we've got the placard, yeah. um, which is, a rel at least in England, a relatively new thing, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. The, the English are, are funny that way because they, they have their very clearly individual, their own ideas about how all of this equipment should work. And let's not forget that, you know, moving out of the 14th century, this is a time of great wealth and military power in England. Mm. They, are, they are not some kind of political and cultural backwater. They are a major power. After Agincourt, the, the German Emperor Sigismund made a personal visit to England. Henry V's status on the international stage was enormous. Uh, the English are, you know, they're a major military power, and they, they de therefore, major military powers define, they design and build their own kit. You know, the United States does not buy fighter planes from France. <laughs> Perfectly good, but major military powers build, design, conceive, and develop their own equipment according to their own fighting styles. And it was the same in the 15th century as it is now. But at the same time... Um, the English were, were not, you know, they were not opposed to being aware of continental developments and, and taking them and adopting them when, when they were useful. Uh, and the, and this, this two-part construction of the body armor is one of the critical 15th century developments. So can you just show us where the placard is and, and yeah. describe what so it is? The, the placard is the, this section from the waist, the natural waist, just below the rib cage, uh, up to the middle of the chest, okay? And so can, you've got this single plate, we can just the see upper the line. edge of which is delineating right through the middle of the upper body, okay? Yeah. And that plate um, moves up onto the, um, the upper breast plate, and is strapped on with a central strap, which the sculptor of our effigy here has very conveniently, at great te uh, technical difficulty, carved the strap and the buckle on the, on the placard there. And that centrally strapped two-part cuirass is like one of the standard mm. armor features throughout Europe uh, from the you know, 1430s onwards. Mm. It doesn't appear in England any earlier than the late 1420s. But by this period, again, and, and, and Lord Bardolf here is wearing an absolutely super high-tech armor for the mid to late 1430s. He's got that. He's actually got an even more recent development, which many people wouldn't have yet for, for another few years. If you, look, if you look down inside, you can see that the placard is only attached to the upper breastplate by this central strap. Okay, but initially the earliest Italian uh, versions of this and the earliest versions to appear in England had side straps as well. Right. Because they just wanted to have that security. Mm. And it took them a few years to realize that those side straps actually impede mobility. Yeah. And you don't need them. You can get rid of them. Sometimes you have to try something for a while before you realize it doesn't need to be there and you get rid of it. Yeah. But he's on his armor, his up-to-date high-tech armor, he's already gotten rid of those side straps. And that's, that's quite, a, quite an up-to-date you know, feature. And does that give a bit of mobility between the upper and the lower? Um, it gives tremendous amount yeah. of mobility. I mean, I mean you, your whole upper body is now working kind of in the armor kind of like a ball and socket joint. Yeah. And your upper body can... You know, there's movement that is focused in this area. Yeah. And you can, if you think about, you know, subtle movements in, in foot combat, certainly, mm. where, you know, just ducking your upper torso out of the way is all you need to defend against a particular blow. And it might just, you need that subtlety of movement. Mm. This, this really gives you that. Even things like getting on and off a horse, I should imagine, are made easier. That, by that helps too. Yeah. I mean, the English are not so worried about that. But yeah, yeah it's, uh, any movement is welcome. You know, the... Of course, I, I often talk about um, operating, learning to operate an armor rather than learning to wear an armor because it is like operating a piece of machinery. It is like learning to drive a forklift or something. And you have to get used to the limitations in movement, the, get used to carrying the weight. You have to get very used to what the armor will let you do and what it won't let you do. 
But equally, you learn to use the incredible advantages that it gives you as well. You know, if someone like this, armed in this way, is fighting, you know, archers or lower infantrymen who haven't got very much hard armor on, mm. and they have exposed faces and exposed hands, and I mean, this guy can hurt you with just about any part of his body. Any <laughs> part of his body touches you in a particular way, it's going to hurt. It's going to do damage. Mm. And, and learning to use the armor defensively and, and just you, learning what you can do and how far you can push it mm. is part of learning how, how to wear it. So before we move on from the, the placa and the breastplate in general, um, presumably that would be more or less mirrored with the backplate. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean <laughs> we have to guess a bit. But you, you light, you light there on one of the issues with looking at effigies, which is what on earth is going on on the back. Now, some of these, uh, it's it's a, it's down to the skill of the carver. Some of this is all one piece of alabaster. This is all coming out of one block. So the more you push the modeling, the more you're undercutting, you're taking risks. You know, you put one or two chisel blows in the wrong place and you've ruined this whole project. So it takes great skill to undercut an arm completely so that you can see air down there. This is all one piece, you know? Uh, and the degree to which they model the back comes down to the skill of the sculptor and the amount of money he's being paid, really. But here, this is a great example, because you can see the whole rear surface of the, of the shoulder plate. Mm. You can see that these spodlers have actually now starting to grow little wing extensions in the back. They're starting to turn into what we would now call a pauldron. Yeah. I mean, these, they were calling So it, that they can overlay, overlap yes, the back yeah, plate. And you just get yeah. better protection in the back. Yeah. Uh, and better interaction with the back plate. Uh, and we can also see that the line delineating the lower body armor from the upper continues right round and then starts to cut up again. So this, in this case, it's a reasonable, uh, it's pretty reasonable to assume that what's going on in the front is basically what's going on in the back. Great. So let's have a look at the um, arms and hands now. Mm -hmm. So the arm harness hasn't changed an awful lot, really, has it, since the 14th century? No, no, it's, it's changing in a couple of subtle ways. Um, if you if you come and kind of take a top view of it, he's now got quite a nice extension into uh, the inner arm to pr help try and protect the tendons in the inner part of the one elbow. of the very few vulnerable mm -hmm. places. Yes, yeah. Yeah. again, cover those vulnerable places. You know, yeah. lock it up as far as you can. I mean, they did have these little swallow tail indentations in the 14th century, mm. but they usually are not extending down into the elbow itself. And this is. This is one of the earliest examples of that, of them trying to close out. And this is also a nice, comparatively early example of a fluted um, side wing. Mm. They were doing this in the Agincourt period, but this is a nice example. Mm. And you can start to see that the flutes, in some cases, are not just sharp uh, ridges. They actually are kind of like ribs. Yeah. They're starting to take on a kind of root-like or, or vine-like quality. And it's incredibly sculptural, isn't it? I mean, it's, totally. not, it's yeah. not, not only has this had the Latin um, decorated edging, but the, the plate itself is, mm -hmm. it, is formed in so many planes. Mm -hmm. it's so, what I, I mean, like about this too is that you've got these wonderful flutes or ridges, mm. but then it continues right through the the yellow methyl edge yeah so you've got you've got this wonderful undulation going on continuing the form and to get to get all of that decoration to match up with all of that i mean it's just it's just very impressive work and here we've got two little articulating lames above and below the yeah yeah cooter. the artist the artist here has had a little bit of a problem you know it's really beautifully rendered but there are a couple of technical issues with armor that often catch artists out uh, and one of them is precisely the way the articulation lames should behave. And, and here he's not, you know, if you follow where these lames are going, they're not really going in the right places. He's really, he's really followed the, the line, he's just following the line of the main plate, when actually these articulation lames should sort of converge in the middle a bit more. But that's a minor point. We know that he means to show us that there are two articulation lames on the top, 
and two on the bottom. Right. And normally on Italian armor this period, you'd have one on the top and, and, and one or two on the bottom. Okay. So the two and two thing, I mean, it's not unprecedented, but that's what the English do. And, you know, that's, that's, that's going to give you good good range of movement. So looking at the gauntlets, um, are these quite conservative in style? They certainly got a, a look of some earlier gauntlets. Sure, yeah. I mean, the English are conservative in the sense that if something is working well for them, they're not going to change it. Uh, so in that sense, yeah, these gauntlets in the 1430s, early 40s, still look a lot like gauntlets in the late 14th century. Um, but they're combined with very new features as well. I mean, one, of the, one of the new things that's happening with English gauntlets at this period is that the cuff is now being extended. Um, you know, some of your viewers might recall that you know, the hourglass, so-called hourglass gauntlets of the late 14th century, uh, they, they have very short mm. flared cuffs. These are now longer cuffs that are more tightly fitted to the lower arm. And if you're going to do that, you've got to have articulation at the mm. wrist. Otherwise, you can't. can't so it's work. a sort of chicken and egg thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. if, you, if you've got articulated wrists, you can make the cuffs smaller. Right, and, yeah. right, right, right. So, the, um, so he's got these articulated wrists. The artist here has really shown us quite nicely how the, the plates in flexion are collapsing over each other mm. in, when he assumes this position of prayer. Yeah. Um, the artist here hasn't shown us any rivets or anything on those articulations, and there probably should be something there. And actually, if you look at brasses of this same period, the brasses show you the articulation mm. points, the rivet points. So that's, again, a nice example of how the two art forms can kind of complement each other. They sometimes sort of show a semicircular projection, mm -hmm. don't they, with the rivets yeah. overlapping yeah. each layer. I mean, I, I would have still, of course, encourage any armorer who's interested in this to try and build something like this. It gives you the impression of one of those collapsing Boy Scout cups. I mean, it could be know? done like the fold you know? with internal leathers or something, couldn't it? Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? But <laughs> we know from the documents that by this period, Everybody understood that English, are, English gauntlets in particular were somehow distinctive. There's a, there's a purchase record in the, in, the, in the wardrobe of the Duke of Burgundy, Philip the Good, that mm. refers to the Duke of Burgundy buying a pair of gauntlets a la façon d'Angleterre in the English fashion. Mm. And that's a continental person. Mm. A Burgundian saying, I recognize that these gauntlets I am buying are somehow distinctively English. And I, th I think that's, that's very tantalizing. And the Burgundians, of course, had a thing for English, English things at this time, didn't they? They were yeah, emulating was, longbow. Uh, right. It was, it was, to some extent, through the 15th century, kind of a mutual appreciation society. Yeah. In the sense that the, the English were very heavily influenced by the Burgundians as well. And, mm. and they, but certainly some of the great chroniclers, like Philippe de Comines at the end of the 15th century, say that the Burgundians learned uh, the tactic of fighting with their knights on foot from the English. And we also know that they had an awfully hard time getting their Burgundian knights to get off their horses. They actually had to institute at one point a capital punishment for anyone who disobeyed the order to get off your horse. So clearly it was a, it was a, a point of contention. Uh, but these are, the, yeah, in many cases, these are still kind of late versions so of the hourglass. So we've still got the gadlings and we've still got the, yeah. the fingers. It, it's and also important to say on this particular example that we're looking at, this has been at some point attacked by iconoclasts in the 17th or, or, or century or, or something. And they've, they've cut off with an axe blow or something, they've cut off the tips of his fingers. And what you're seeing, these have been recarved when the, when the thing was restored in the 19th century. In the 1840s, the whole chapel was, was restored. Mm. Um, and they've recarved the fingernails that are represented on the armor. Mm. So what you, where you see the fingernails now should really be another, the lower knuckles. Right. So he's not supposed to have unusually short fingers. <laughs> You're supposed to see another set of these gold plates on the end or at least some other articulation and the fingers should be should be out here somewhere. Uh, and the fingernails, that could be an original feature. Can it they, was, they did, it yeah, was. they did have fingernails. Yeah. There are plenty of examples with pristine fingers and they emboss and chase uh, the fingernails onto the gauntlets. It's oh, really? A nice, a nice feature, yeah. And do you think many of these armors, I mean, I know your own famous armor, which some of the viewers will be familiar with, um, is 
is blued, very mm -hmm. deeply blued. Mm -hmm. Do you think very much of this armor would have been colored in some way? Mm -hmm. Some of them were. Um, I, the English clearly liked the polished, the polished armor. Mm. And uh, I mean, there are continental descriptions of English uh, knights on the continent, There's Italian chronicles that describe the English blazing uh, with all their polished polished mm. helmets and polished armor. And, and there's one Italian chronicler, I think I mentioned it in the book, who, who mentions that the English are constantly polishing their armor. And then as soon as their knights take their armor off at the end of the day, their, their, their valets are immediately you know, scrubbing the stuff and polishing it, and they never stop. You just can't get so, the valets nowadays, though, can you? Know, you? So. <laughs> it's hard to stay shiny. Yeah. Yeah, that was important. But there are some effigies. There are a couple of examples that survive with enough painted decoration to show that they had black armors. Mm. There's a couple of nice examples around in this area where it still has enough of the polychromatic uh, decoration to show that the main surfaces of the armor were black. Black, black, not wow. blue, black. Yeah. Um, and they sometimes combine that with fully gilded elbows and mm. knees, or they have fully gilded shoulders and then blackened upper and lower arms, mm. gilded gauntlets, black fingers, gold fingernails. You know, there, there's a lot of that kind mm. of thing. But the color does play a role, and you see that right through the, the 15th century, just as you do on the continent. You yeah. have to, in all styles in the 15th century, you have to allow for some painted armor, some blackened armor, blued armor, gilded, all of that. Mm -hmm. So looking at the final elements, the shoulders uh, are very interesting here because we've got a development of the earlier type of spaulders, but mm -hmm. here very clearly with this shell-like mm -hmm. besigue yep, yep, uh, protecting yep. the armpit. And again, it's about covering one of those, the last vulnerable gaps. Yeah, and it, it, the besigue is again a nice example of that, that wrestling between the, the protection and mobility. Um, you know, to get, keep the protection, it, to keep the mobility in the shoulders, you can't start putting too much solid plate growing out from the point of the elbow in t onto the breastplate. As soon as you do that, you limit mobility. But you need more frontal protection, so keeping the shoulder articulation localized, but then adding these plates on top. This is a plate that can move. You know, it, mm. it can move with the movement of the shoulder, and it's one way of getting more plate in there. Mm. without interfering too much with the mobility. And it just hangs on a, on a point or a leather, presumably? Uh, it's usually more securely mounted than most, you know, uh, right. most living history people have realized. Uh, sometimes they're just pointed on, yeah. but quite a lot of the time they are on a thicker piece of leather so that they're more stable. Sometimes even they're riveted solidly onto the plate underneath. Really? And I found some evidence even of them working on slots. Wow. So the, 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 the spodler itself is slotted and the, 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 the best of you can move a bit that way. Okay. There's, there's, there's lots of different ways the best of you are actually mounted. And these spodlers themselves are interesting, aren't they? Because the, the overlapping lames seem to overlap upwards. Yep. And they seem yep. to go all the way over the shoulder. And right the way underneath and the bassinet. And they go bassinet. under the helmet. Yeah. The critical thing is that they go under the helmet. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, when you've got a, a, helm, a, ba a great bassinet like this with these flaring neck plates, uh, it's going out onto the shoulder. And the interaction of helmet and shoulder plate is a critical thing. And, and there are enough examples on the English effigies and in other um, uh, uh, depictions that show these plates going right up the sides of the neck mm. on the inside. Um, and, you know, I've talked about that at great length in the book. Um, but you need that interaction. You've got solid plates coming down. So the shoulder plate either has to stay down there or it has to go under. It can't go on top because the, the flaring neck plate is covering the area where you need to fasten the shoulder defense onto the arming doublet. Mm. Um, and there's no evidence that they punched holes in the helmet to bring the laces through or anything. Um, so that, that, that's another... With all of these things, there's this issue of how, how do the plates, the assemblies that are next to each other, how do they interact? How do you ensure a good interaction between the greave and the sabaton, between the, the arm and the shoulder, between the shoulder and the helmet, between the gauntlet and the arm? You know, all of those points of interaction have to work well. Mm. And if they don't work well, 
you know, your ability to fight, you know, rapidly gets degraded. So let's finish off by looking at what's one of the most striking and obvious elements to lots of English armors, and this being a perfect example, mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the so-called great bassinet. Yeah, the great bassinet. It's like, for this period, it's the classic English thing. Uh, they started wearing them uh, in the, as early as the first decade of the 15th century. They're becoming the classic feature by the, you know, the time of Agincourt. And uh, they survived right the way through the 15th century. I mean, even after they stopped wearing them generally on the battlefield um, in the 1450s, uh, they still maintained a really important function in tournaments and individual deeds of arms, formal combats of all kinds. Um, I mean, the origin of the, the great bassinet uh, is really those most crucial problems. Uh, for me, one of the most crucial challenges is protection of the throat. Mm. Because this is a really vulnerable part of the body. You know, that, the, the, you know the, the, the esophagus, all of that important stuff in there is close to the skin, easily damaged. It can be damaged not only by cutting action, but by crushing action. Mm. Uh, you can hurt it easily, uh, and it's, it's catastrophic when, when any damage does happen. At the same time, as it being incredibly vulnerable, it also is a central part of the most basic issue of mobility, the ability to look around, the ability to look down, to look up. You, you've got to have great protection and great mobility in this area. And that's a, design, a major design problem. Mm -hmm. In the 14th century, they come up with the idea of the aventail, the very generally very densely woven mail, heavy mail, that is reinforced usually with very strong, almost upholstered linings, mm. backings underneath to give a kind of really strong but flexible defense. But, you know, by the time you have lance rest developing and you're able to hit people in the throat with a, you know, a rest assisted lance, you can get through that. You really need hard uh, armor protecting the throat. Mm. And the, the great bassinet was one of the first ways that they did that. And it, do, it does seem to have been almost an obsession in, in England. Mm -hmm. as a, a, mm -hmm. The universal helmet, really, wasn't it? Between, yeah. between about 1415 and about 1440 to 50. They're still, they're still wearing them in the 1450s. Yeah. I think, uh, I think you, you would only stop seeing bassinets on the battlefields of the Wars of the Roses in the 1460s. They'd, you'd still see them, but they're, they're disappearing by that point. But there's plenty of examples of them being worn in the 1450s. They're good helmets. They're strong. You feel safe in them. Yeah. I mean, it's, this is like a fortification <laughs> for, the, for your head and throat. It's like a cu cuirass, actually, yeah, for your head, and, isn't it? You know, it seems very, very limiting in its mobility. But actually, you can turn your head inside it to mm -hmm. a bit, you know, to a degree. And this English construction, uh, where you have pivot points on the top of the of the outer chin plate means that the 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 the, the inner chin plate can move a bit up and down mm. inside so the head can nod a bit inside the throat plates and that combined with movement inside the skull you can move move around a bit more than you might think but it's still very restrictive there's just no way around that and and learning to wear one of these is about learning to move your whole body a bit more. Mm. It's you know like Michael Keaton in Batman. You, know, <laughs> you couldn't, you can't, you know, you, you see him moving in the same way you need to move to some extent in a great bassinet. But at the end of the day, if you're expecting to fight on foot and you're expecting someone to hit you in the head with a, a pole axe, yeah, a lot. if yes. you're going to be hit in the head with a pole axe, you want something that's going to support your neck, and you're going to yeah. give up some yeah. of that mobility and and, and being else. struck in the face. Yeah. You also you also need Need, you know protection from being not hit directly in the face and knocked back and there's this is strapped down to breastplate strapped uh, in some cases strapped down to the back plate almost invariably um, you know it, it, it's really reinforcing you from from the shock of those blows Okay, well, Toby, let's wrap up this video there. But thanks a lot. That's been absolutely um, fantastic and really really in-depth. So thank you. Okay Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, 
You can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.